Hi, I'm Oliver and this is Deep Cuts, a channel dedicated to music for lovers of music. First off, Happy New Year to all of you. I hope you enjoyed your holidays. I hope you enjoyed eating too much, fighting with your family, you know, all that holiday shit. Um, welcome to Bowie Week. This is my chance to commemorate and discuss the legendary icon, the man who influenced music, influenced musicians, people all over the world. He's got a career spanning 25 albums, five decades. There's so much here to get stuck into. So I'm doing a guide today. I'm going to do a guide on his life's work from birth all the way across to Blackstar and his passing on January 2016. Because there's so much to talk about, I don't want to cram it all into one video because I won't be able to go into too much detail. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to split this guide into two. And I'm going to start today by talking about his life all the way up to 1977's Heroes. And then on Wednesday, I'll upload the second part, which will be from 1979's Lodger all the way up to 2016's Black Star. So look out for that on Wednesday. So this guide will make up two of the three Bowie Week videos that I'm doing. The third one's going to be released on Saturday the 7th, which leads into his birthday on the 8th of January. It's something completely different. It's, it's Essentially, it's my tribute to David Bowie. I love him. He's always been a big influence on me. So it's my chance to say thank you in a way and help celebrate his life and his music. Uh, it's something completely different. So I've had fun making it and I hope you enjoy watching it. As always, I've made a huge Spotify playlist to accompany this guide, so if you feel like pausing the video, going back to it, um, and listening to some of the music I'm talking about as I do it, then you're welcome to do so. And I think that's it, let's start. David Bowie, birth name David Robert Jones, was born on the 8th of January 1947 in South London. Brixton to be specific. As you might expect, he was already exhibiting a talent and an interest in music, which was discovered by his teachers, who saw that in choir rehearsals and recorder practices that he was taking a lot of interest in the topic. He had a vast and prolific love for music, even in his childhood, getting to experience albums from Little Richard and Elvis Presley, but enjoying them equally as much as he was enjoying the jazz greats like Coltrane and Mingus. He messed around with the saxophone, ukulele, piano, recorder, really feeling out the different modes of instrumentation and starting to familiarise himself with the differences between them. He wasn't just a softy arty type though. <laughs> Why did I say that? He constantly used to get in fights at school and one day got in a fight with a boy over a girl, pretty typical story, and the guy hit him so hard that he landed in hospital. We didn't land, didn't literally fly into hospital. He ended up in hospital for four months with a permanently dilated pupil, which is why his eyes look the way they did. So there's a little fable for you kids. Get, have fights, get beaten up, and then you'll become a multi-millionaire pop star. Despite the stratospheric success he found in the 70s, David didn't exactly stumble across his fame. He spent much of the 60s working very hard to try and make it, try and get his songs noticed by the general audience, by critics, by the music press, and it was a number of, of failed attempts through singles and different bands, different lineups, and different names as well. He had a wedding band, the Conrads, and they failed to get a contract. He then fronted Davy Jones and the King Bees, and they had a few hits like Liza Jane and Louis Go Home. I say hits, they didn't particularly do that well. And I think that's probably because it was that kind of rough around the edges R&B sound that by 1964 had been done over and over again. They were in a sea of imitators of R&B and as such didn't really stand out particularly. So, so Davy Jones and the King Bees never really did that much and never really made a stamp at all. There was also the Manish Boys and the Lower Third, but it wasn't until 1966 that the music press finally took notice of the boy from Brixton who was designing clothes in Carnaby Street and working tirelessly to try and cement a musical career. During this time, he released his first single under the David Bowie moniker, Can't Help Thinking About Me. He recently changed his name from Davy Jones to David Bowie is because it was inviting a lot of confusion. You had the Davy Jones from the Monkees, so he changed it to Bowie, which was a lot more unique. So during this time when he released Can't Help Thinking About Me, he was interviewed by NME, and that early on you can tell his interest in theatricality and the idea of narrative within music. I want to act. I like to do character parts. I think it takes a lot to become somebody else. It takes some doing. In 67, David released a hilariously odd single called The Laughing Gnome, which contains his voice sped up to sound like a laughing gnome. It's really quite strange. It includes some amazing puns, uh, such as a, a metra gnome and the London School of Ecker gnomics. Convinced yet? Hey, Bizarre shit, but pretty funny. 
Strangely enough, this also failed to do anything chart-wise for David. But six weeks later, he released his first full-length debut album, David Bowie. Interesting bit of trivia, this record was actually released the same day as the Beatles' Sgt Pepper. Talk about going up against it, Jesus. This album follows in that strange idiosyncratic footprint that began with the single The Laughing Gnome. It's an album of interesting ideas, but it's not really the, uh, the triumphant beginning of David Bowie's career. Bowie himself wanted to ignore the record's existence not long after, as when he started achieving his success, commenting on how the album was very rushed and altogether quite strange. Listening to it again, it really reminds me of the kinks, and it's certainly an acquired taste. Like It's very kitsch and very of its time, which is not something I think you can say for a lot of Bowie's records in the 70s that really broke boundaries. Despite not probably being at the top of the David Bowie discography quality-wise, there's still some very interesting moments on the album. The track We Are Hungry Hungry Men uh, talks about population control and cannibalism and infanticide and really jars with the twee instrumentation. This is a clear beginning of Bowie's real interest in narration within songwriting. You know, this song is narrated from the point of view of a messiah who turns up on in different modes and different configurations throughout Bowie's musical career, including as the protagonist in 1972's The Rise and Fall. Elsewhere on the record, the unexpected closer of Please Mr. Gravedigger is this strange shrouded track uh, which with only rain splatters and thunder as the instrumental accompaniment to Bowie's voice uh, and, and his narrator has a horrendous cold and keeps sneezing and coughing. It's pretty weird but I think it shows his compulsion to experiment and a willingness to really push away from the obvious tropes of the music that he loved and the music that he listened to to try and make something unique and interesting. Even if it doesn't quite pay off at least shows at this level that he was pushing for that. When you listen to this record back, I think you can clearly see why the man himself wanted to forget its existence. It desperately wants to have an identity. You can hear that when you're listening to it, but it just failed to do so. And in the end, it, it failed to do anything success and chart-wise for David, much like The Laughing Gnome. Uh, and the next few years were a little bit slapdash in terms of the things that he was doing. He was in an ice cream advert, he performed in a mime act, and he was running a folk open mic night at a South London pub, which is not what you expect for the beginning of David Bowie's career, because most people remember those 70s moments, but at this point he was still really struggling to make a success of himself. But in July 1969, five days before the Apollo 11 launch, David Bowie released Space Oddity, one of the most iconic singles in his entire catalogue of music. A beautiful song drenched in gorgeous strings, melancholic acoustic guitar, and a vocal delivery from David that has so much confidence that the debut album was lacking. It's a real assured delivery in this song. That sax runoff into the guitar solo after the hand claps on this track is one of my favourite musical moments bar none. It's just, it's so infectious. I could listen to that over and over again. There's a lot of metaphor to deal with in this song with the character Major Tom blasting off into space so far above the world and being disconnected from reality, which people saw as being quite emblematic of uh, Bowie's disconnection with society through his extensive drug use. Bowie did also reveal, however, that the song was heavily inspired by Stanley Kubrick's masterpiece 2001, A Space Odyssey. And I think you can, you can there's a similar atmosphere there. I think he, he synthesized that feeling that 2001 gives you quite well, perhaps minus the, the creeping dread that that film manages to convey. Anyway, following on from the huge success of Space Oddity, Bowie released David Bowie in November of 1969. Yeah, it was called that, just to add confusion, this album was also called David Bowie in the UK when it was released. Once uh, the massive success of Ziggy Stardust hit the world in 1972, RCA re-released this album and called it Space Oddity. So I will refer to it as Space Oddity, just for posterity. The record's a bit of a mess, really. It's been openly admitted that it was rushed out due to the success of the single Space Oddity, and even producer Tony Visconti said it was an awful record for him because at the time he was still learning the ropes of production and, in his own words, didn't know anything. For those of you that don't know, Visconti went on to be a hugely influential producer that's to produce some of the most groundbreaking albums, including some of the best albums in Bowie's own catalogue. The style of this record is much more cohesive Adhesive than the debut LP. Um, you know, it's like an amalgam of folk rock stapled together with jangly acoustic guitar, and you can feel that going through each track on the album. But that Space Oddity opener is such a hard height to hit 
that you know the record inevitably fails to reach that height again. Despite that, there are some great tracks here that certainly deserve some recognition. Signet Committee is a bold, psychedelic track which sitting at over nine minutes long is one of Bowie's longest recorded tracks and uh, it has this beautiful languid atmosphere to it. The lyricism on this track is as bold as Bowie's delivery. He details his view on the hippie movement being a regressive and ultimately self-destructive entity. Words of strength and care and sympathy. I opened doors that would have blocked their way. I braved their cause to guide for little pay. Wild Eyed Boy from Free Cloud is another brilliant track. It's theatrical and symphonic. It has bombastic percussion, fluttering harp, and soaring violins. Ultimately, the album didn't do that well commercially, again, despite this huge success of the Space Oddity single. His next record, 1970's The Man Who Sold the World, is a completely different change up from the folky leanings of Space Oddity. That's right, David Bowie goes rock. I'm really sorry, I'll never do that again. At the time, David felt he was missing out on having a group of musicians that could act as a touring band and a recording band, people that he would be able to get on with in his own personal time and be able to connect with. With this, sessions for the LP commenced with Mick Ronson on electric guitar, Tony Visconti on bass and doing production, and then also Mick Woodmansey on drums. They did originally have a drummer called John Cambridge, but he was fired due to some creative differences with Bowie. One of the biggest footprints this record left was the, actually the album art and uh, the mythos surrounding that album art. If you have a look at it, Bowie's in a dress, which began this androgynous experimental fashion, which he brought through into the 70s, which created a lot of controversy because of the attitudes of 1960s and 1970s Britain. Really, all of this defined him just as much as his music, but we're here to talk about music obviously. Opening track, Width of a Circle, is an eight minute long frenetic rock out with Mick Woodmansey's muscular guitar work providing a framework for um, Tony Visconti's brawny bass lines and Mick Woodmansey's Bonham-esque drumming. Bowie himself said this record dealt thematically with his feelings of depression and existentialism, specifically on the track Width of a Circle. I tried to analogize the period of my life from when I left school to that time to the making of that LP just for my own benefit, not really for any listener's benefit. I very much doubt whether anyone could decipher that song correctly on my level, but a lot of people have deciphered it on their own levels. That's fine, that's what a song does. Much of it might be difficult to decipher, but these lines are probably the most revealing. And the rumour spread that I was ageing fast, then I ran across a monster who was sleeping by a tree, and I looked and frowned, and the monster was me. The theme of alienation and confusion about the world around him can be found on other tracks on the record, including All the Mad Men. Because I'd rather stay here with all the mad men than perish with the sad men roaming free. This track is actually about Bowie's half-brother Terry, who was committed to a mental asylum for schizophrenia in 1969 and subsequently didn't want to leave. He felt safer within the asylum. The most recognisable song on this album is, of course, the title track, The Man Who Sold the World. This track has a samba vibe to it with that standout slippery riff from Mick Ronson on guitar, and that's accompanied by a guiro, which is one of these things, you know, you use a uh, it's made out of wood and it makes that strange scraping wooden sound. A spacious moog is used also to create a hazy and uneasy atmosphere. I've always thought listening to this track it's almost like the epitome of paranoia. Even Bowie's vocals are uh, phased with phase effects uh, which makes it sound like he's kind of shifting in and out of reality. Such a strange vibe to it this song. Great song and good album as well. Then we get the release of Hunky Dory in 1971. I've always loved this record. By all accounts, it is just before that moment where David Bowie becomes the name in everybody's mouths for the next 40 years. The rock songwriting of the previous LP is dialed back and piano is introduced, which changes the timbre of the music. And there's a little bit of that pop sprinkle left over from Space Oddity. Oh yeah, remember that kid who punched Bowie in the face at school and permanently dilated his pupil? Well, he actually helped work on this album art, which is a brilliant story. George Underwood, who was the kid, and Bowie became great friends later on in their lives, and uh, Underwood went on to create album art for T-Rex and Gentle Giant, and uh, this as well as helping with the Ziggy Stardust cover. What a happy ending. I think this is the beginning of Bowie really carving out his own unique sound. When you listen to albums like The Man Who Sold the World and Space Oddity, 
whilst they are good, they are also heavily derivative and they rely on the musical zeitgeist to curry favour with the music listening public. On this record we have the same band minus Tony Visconti who was replaced as bassist by Trevor Boulder who would remain in the band for the next few years and also some of the more complex piano parts were filled in at the studio by prog legend Rick Wakeman. Opening track Changes is a glittery pop gem, probably the most emblematic song about Bowie's chameleon personality and, and, and representative of all the changes that we all go through throughout our lives. The eighth note melody of the piano within the chorus is quite kitsch and twee and I think it would be the sort of thing that might put me off if it wasn't incorporated so seamlessly into the track. It allows the track to have a charm without being too cheesy I suppose. Oh You Pretty Things is probably one of my favourite David Bowie tracks. It's all about his reaction to finding out he was going to become a father. Don't you know you're driving your mamas and papas insane? Let me make it plain. You've got to make way for the homo superior. That last reference about the homo superior actually refers to the ubermensch concept by renowned philosopher Nietzsche, which again shows Bowie has a level of intelligence that really puts him above a lot of his pop contemporaries, so a lot of his musical contemporaries. He really wanted to make sure that his music was engaging and interesting and the lyricism meant something, and he's continuing to do that on this record. Life on Mars is also on this record, a stirring anthem, and again, another one of Bowie's classic songs. I love David's own description of creating this song. This song was so easy, being young was easy. A really beautiful day in the park, sitting on the steps of the bandstand. Sailors bap 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 bap. An anomic, not a gnomic heroine. Middle class ecstasy. I took a walk to Beckenham High Street to catch a bus to Lewisham to buy shoes and shirts but couldn't get the riff out of my head. Jumped off two stops into the ride and more or less looped back to the house up on South End Road. Workspace was a big empty room with a chaise lounge a bargain-priced Art Nouveau screen, William Morris, so I told everyone who asked, <laughs> a huge overflowing freestanding ashtray and a grand piano. Little else. I started working it out on the piano and had the whole lyric and melody finished by late afternoon. How can such an iconic piece of music have been put together so incredibly easy? I mean, yeah, sure, it could be a tall story, but he was a genius, so... I really love this album and I feel that if you've never listened to a David Bowie album start to finish then this is a great place to start. Only six months after the release of Hunky Dory, in June of 1972, the rise and fall of Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars literally smashed into the public consciousness, whipped up in a frenzy of platform boots, leather and glitter. Bowie had been experimenting with the alter ego Ziggy Stardust for a little while, but on this record he brought that character into full view. An omnisexual alien rock star delivered to Earth as a messenger with his backing band The Spiders from Mars, which was Ronson, Woodmansey and Boulder. We're talking huge success with this record. It remained in the UK albums chart for two years and also brought Hunky Dory into the album chart with it, sort of dragged it in because of the success of Ziggy Stardust. Obviously the years ahead of its time fashion iconography was part of the success and the attention that Bowie gained from this album, but let's not forget that musically this album is a bona fide masterpiece. A brilliant collision of rock and roll and pop sensibility, kind of like an amalgam of Hunky Dory and The Man Who Sold The World. Uh, and it doesn't put a single note wrong from start to finish, becoming a clear purveyor of the glam rock sound that became such a massive part of the 70s. Opening track Five Years charts Earth's realisation of its impending destruction. Pushing through the market square, so many mothers sighing. News had just come over. We had five years left to cry in. Bowie concentrates lyrically on the people, which is what gives this song so much power. And all the fat, skinny people. And all the tall, short people. And all the nobody people. And all the somebody people. I never thought I'd need so many people. The accompanying piano motif is so mournful and joining it is this meandering drum pattern from Woodmansey which adds to the atmosphere of that lyrical content. This record doesn't continue with that disconsolate pace though. 
uh, after the track five years. It flies through at a breakneck pace, a track after track of seminal riffs and intense energy. And, and there's so much vitality in this record listening to it in 2016. I can't imagine how it must have sounded in 1972. The soaring chorus of Moon Age Daydream with its climbing violin phrases, the inimitable riff of Ziggy Stardust, the brash rock and roll of Star. There's just so much great stuff on this album. It's a complete classic. Go and listen to it if you haven't already. Then in 73, after a very successful tour as Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars, Bowie releases Aladdin Sane, which he describes as Ziggy Goes to America. The arrangements feel even more audacious than they are on the rise and fall, with Bowie, producer Ken Scott and the Spiders all high from the phenomenal success of Ziggy Stardust. I feel like when you listen to this record you can tell it's a post-success release, with its intrepid arrangements and its exploratory lyricism, which is unflinching in a way. The atonal schizophrenic piano lines in title track Aladdin Sane jar against the sax melody and simplistic bass and drum beats, um, and, and it creates this creeping neurosis and paranoia. Cracked Actor starts as a standard blues number, but it's through a lens of distortion and feedback, and it retains this, this menacing crunch throughout. The track Time has a really idiosyncratic moment about 40 seconds in, where the instrumentation begins to climb in a really fractured way up over the top of Bowie's crooning. Time, in quaaludes and red wine, demanding Billy Idols and other friends of mine, take your time. This line relates back to his friend Billy Mercier from the New York Dolls, who sadly died of a drug overdose in 1972 whilst at a party in London. So this lyricism is like Bowie's cautionary warning against the partying lifestyle that he was so entrenched in in the late 1960s and continued to be so throughout the early and mid 1970s. The Gene Genie was a single release from this record, a strutting blues number uh, with harmonica and this very untethered vocal delivery from David himself, almost arrhythmic in its delivery. Another great album to follow Ziggy Stardust with another album which is daring and impressive. It's just, just incredible and it's no wonder that his popularity continued to soar throughout the 70s. During this album cycle, Bowie retired the Ziggy Stardust character, his last performance being at the Hammersmith Odeon in London in 1973. Uh, so... Pinups. This album was actually released in the same year as Aladdin Sane and sports Twiggy, the supermodel, on the cover. This is more of a completist's release, really. It was done as a quick cash in to try and gain a bit more ground with the US audience. So it's a collection of covers from people like the Kinks, Pink Floyd, and The Who. And, and it's, I guess it's interesting to hear him cover some different artists, people that he liked, influencers and things like that, but, but it's definitely one for checking out after you've checked out all of these studio albums. Then next year in 1974, Bowie releases his eighth LP, Diamond Dogs. Maybe a good candidate for the worst album art ever. During 1974, Bowie moved to the USA, first being in New York and then settling into LA. Here he began writing the music for Diamond Dogs, uh, which developed from this fascination of Orwell's novel 1984 and also the idea of a post-apocalyptic city setting. The record is a sort of loose concept of that idea. Orwell's estate wouldn't allow him to make the uh, 1984 musical that he wanted to. Um, and then he, he also developed the new character, Halloween Jack, who had an eye patch and was one of the people living within this post-apocalyptic city that he was creating these songs around. The themes of social and political control created something Bowie himself described as his most political record. My protest more than anything I've done previously. The record retains much of that rock and roll aesthetic from Ziggy Stardust and Aladdin Sane, but it fuses it with funk, soul, and the theatricality of American Broadway musicals. The title track is another blues rock riffage, very Rolling Stones-esque, but the lyrics are bleak in a sort of campy theatrical way. Crawling down the alley on your hands and knees, I'm sure you're not protected for it's plain to see. The diamond dogs are poachers and they hide behind trees, hunt you to the ground they will, mannequins with kill appeal. The big single of the record was Rebel Rebel, uh, which was also the last remnants of Bowie's glam rock output in the 70s. Uh, the song lyrics focus on his sexuality, which was ambiguous and still gaining a lot of controversy and a lot of interest to people at the time. You've got your mother in a whirl. She's not sure if you're a boy or a girl. 
Tracks like 1984 are characterised with a wah pedal funk guitar sound and also soul drenched violin accompaniments, uh, which was a clear precursor to the plastic soul sound that he would move towards in his next album. I'll talk about that in a second. Personally, this album doesn't really do it for me. The themes are interesting and there's some great tracks on it, but for me it falls into obscurity next to albums like Ziggy Stardust and Aladdin Sane and some of his later 70s work as well. Uh, and that's just a personal opinion. Some people absolutely love Diamond Dogs and rate it up there with some of his best, just not for me personally. Hey, opinions. In 1975, David Bowie's music took the funk and soul that was peeping through on Diamond Dogs and completely eschewed the glam rock and roll in favour for R&B, funk and soul. And this is what came of the album Young Americans, released in 1975. Bowie himself called the sound of the record Plastic Soul and characterised that as the squashed remains of ethnic music as it survives in the age of Muzak rock, written and sung by a white limey. Plastic Soul was a term originally coined by black musicians to describe white musicians such as Mick Jagger singing music of black origin. Another term that came out of that was Blue-Eyed Soul, which was used to describe people like Tom Jones, The Beatles, and The Righteous Brothers. This record saw a changing up of the band during the recording process, David bringing in um, funk and soul musicians like Andy Newmark and also Luther Vandross. Young Americans did well on release, gaining good critical praise and great sales figures, uh, but I think it's difficult to look back on it and really truly enjoy it now, at least for me anyway. I know that the idea of Plastic Soul is something Bowie implicitly understood and he respected and loved funk, soul and R&B music, but I can't help listening to this and it, it just feels like an inauthentic version of a great soul record. I can go and listen to a great soul record rather than listen to something which feels like an imitation. So again, it's an interesting experiment and it again shows how Bowie is willing to um, step out of the box and do something completely new, collaborate with new kinds of musicians and develop, um, develop a, a different style of music within his own own discography but for me it just the album just doesn't quite work I just don't find it interesting enough to to really catch me it certainly shows his willingness to take big risks and left turns in his discography despite having huge success and you know presumably could continue the formula and create the same sort of music but he's never been an artist that's really done that I really like the track Fascination, co-written by Luther Vandross. It has luscious backing vocals and a funk driving drum pattern from Andy Newmark, which I guess is exactly what you'd expect considering he was the drummer of Sly and the Family Stone. Not a massive fan of that album personally, but it's definitely worth a listen. 1976 was a very hazy year for David Bowie. He starred in the incredible Nick Rogue sci-fi film The Man Who Fell to Earth, which if you haven't seen you should go and see because it's, it's brilliant. Yeah, but he claims he remembers almost nothing about the production because at this stage he was so dependent on cocaine at this period of his life the excess of fame had really started to do him in and he was only he was snorting cocaine only eating peppers and drinking milk he became emaciated and he started saying things in public that were pretty distasteful some pro-fascist comments mentioned some things about hitler and uh, nazi propaganda uh, no one really knew whether this was part of his new character for this period, the Thin White Duke, which was based quite a lot physically on the man who fell to earth, or perhaps just um, the unfortunate side effects of taking too many drugs and addling your brain. Somehow, despite his whacked out mind state, he releases Station to Station, one of his best records. Man oh man, the next streak of records is is incredible. It's, it's his best streak in his entire discography, which is, is insane when you consider the second best streak is Hunky Dory, Ziggy Stardust and Aladdin Sane. I mean, what a career this man has had. Anyway, I digress. This is sort of another transitionary record in his discography, but by no means does that make it a minor record at all. The Sonic Footprint is a suffusion of the plastic soul from 1975's Young Americans, but with more of a leaning towards the funk side of things. An introduction of synthesizers into the instrumentation, and then also the influence of krautrock bands like Noi, Can, and Cluster. If you don't know much about Krautrock, check out the guide I did a few months ago. Quick shameless plug for you. The opening title track of this record is 10 minutes long, a slow burn, repetitious funk track, which has Bowie reflecting on his desire to be an outsider, jarring with his need for an emotional connection. This idea is the epitome of the Thin White Duke, which is a character who can't feel emotions yet sings songs about love. Check out these lyrics. Once there were mountains on mountains, and once there were sunbirds to soar with, and once I could never be down, got to keep searching and searching. Oh, 
what will I be believing and who will connect with me love? He also added some knowing self-deprecation in the mix too. It's not the side effects of the cocaine, I'm thinking that it must be love. Other great tracks to check out are the brilliantly funky Stay and the languorous closer of Wild as the Wind, where Bowie croons, like the leaf clings to the tree, oh my darling cling to me, for we're like creatures of the wind, and wild as the wind, wild as the wind. The band is what really brings this album together sonically. A bass guitarist George Murray and drummer Dennis Davis joined guitarist Carlos Alomar who played on Young Americans and there, as a result there's, there's just such a tightly wound um, musical intensity to all the tracks on this album. They really fuse together well as a band and I think you can really hear that. I mean the whole album is just fantastic. It has like an isolation to it and the isolation's coming a lot from the lyricism from Bowie and it feels like he's disconnected in a way, the way that his vocals are recorded feels disconnected to the tracks in a way and that gives it such an interesting quality. It's just a brilliant album and make sure you go and listen to that. If you've got a list of a couple of albums you want to check out from Bowie, make sure this is on your list, it's brilliant. And here we arrive at my personal favourite David Bowie record and one of my favourite records of all time, 1977's Low. This is the most fascinating period in his career, at least to me anyway. Uh, this is what gave birth to the Berlin Trilogy of Albums, a collection of music that is the most experimental and forward thinking of his entire career. In late 76, after battling with his horrendous drug addiction, David moved from LA all the way over to West Berlin, where he settled and tried to start afresh, clean up his act, and immerse himself in the krautrock and kosmisch music coming out of West Berlin that was a clear influencer of Station to Station. Here, he lived in an apartment with Iggy Pop and began recording sessions with Tony Visconti and the ambient music legend Brian Eno, and together they brought in influences of the motoric krautrock, of um, electronic and avant-garde songwriting and instrumentation. This melting pot of styles and influences really did lead to create one of the most unexpected and unique albums I've ever listened to. Bowie himself said he had no more grand sweeping statements to make, no more character studies like Ziggy or the Thin White Duke or Halloween Jack, uh, and, and just let the music speak for itself. They'd spend hours in the recording studio not having anything written and just playing around with different instrumentations, different sounds to see what would come out of that. This lets the music breathe and allowed Bowie to open up to even more musical influences, flexing and twisting his own musical identity, uh, which became something so much more innovative and fresh. The album is two distinct halves, the first half being this collection of twisted rock tracks through a veil of electronic futurist production, sampling and alien synthesizers. The second half is a much more surreal and experimental part of the record. Barely any vocals from Bowie himself and uh, the music kind of fluctuates in and out. It's a very spacey, different, untethered musical experience. That second half of the album begins with the track A New Career in a New Town, which keeps swapping from this gorgeous synthetic layering of synth sounds and this punchy bass drum hit, and then breaking out into these emotive full band sections led by a wailing harmonica sound from Bowie. Always crashing in the same car is heart-rending, with the band taking centre stage which allows Bowie's lyricism to hazily float in and out of the song. Uh, the whole track just, it feels spacious and metallic and unattainable in some kind of way. That sort of isolated sound though really allows the personal touches of the record to come through, such as Bowie's lonely saxophone line throughout the track Weeping Wall. A sparse electronic track like Warsaw feels like it shouldn't fit in the same album as a hit single like Sound and Vision, but they both share the same musical DNA. They're explorative, sporadic, and unconventional. Ah, Warsaw. I could listen to that track on repeat for hours and hours, those desolate electronic sounds colliding with the Polish folk choir chanting. Just a brilliant, beautiful song and an incredible, incredible album. Make sure you listen to this. Unbelievably, only eight months later, in October of 1977, Bowie releases another classic record, Heroes. The album was actually fully recorded in the Meisterzahl Concert Hall in Berlin, overlooking the Berlin Wall, which during the 70s would be a strange and haunting place to record an album. Visconti himself said, Every afternoon I'd sit down at that desk and see three Russian Red Guards looking at us with binoculars, with their Sten guns over their shoulders. Everything said we shouldn't be making a record here. 
Continuing his partnership with Eno and Visconti, David also enlisted the creative talents of the guitarist of King Crimson, Robert Fripp, one of the most creative and prolific guitarists of the 20th century. This developed a more rock-influenced record than that of Lowe, however still retained the unusual songwriting and exploratory nature that made Lowe so vital in the first place. Heroes follows the same binary structure as Lowe, the first half more conventional, the second half a fluctuating, floating collage of instrumentals and sounds. The binary structure of both albums has been said to be thematically linked to the two different sides of Germany in the 1970s, representing that very big plane of difference and conflict that the two were having during the 1970s. On the clattering opener of Beauty and the Beast, it appears the lyrical themes are thematically linked to that binary opposition, the idea of communism versus democracy in Germany at the time. Something in the night, something in the day, nothing is wrong but darling, something's in the way. There's slaughter in the air, protest on the wind, something else inside me, someone could get skinned, how? Moss Garden is this album's Warsaw. It has lofty synths and Bowie abstractly picks this Japanese string instrument called a koto over the top of it. So serene and ethereal. The title track Heroes is another iconic song, a story of doomed lovers that was inspired by Bowie spotting Visconti, who was married at the time, kissing one of the backing singers next to the Berlin Wall. I, I wish you could swim, like the dolphins, like dolphins can swim, though nothing, nothing will keep us together. We can beat them forever and ever. Oh, we can be heroes just for one day. The seminal instrumentation here consists of Robert Fripp's feedback-drenched pitched guitar and Brian Eno playing an EMS VCS3, which is one of these. Furthermore, in a genius ploy by Visconti, he moved the mic further and further away from Bowie during the vocal recording of this track, which forced him to shout louder and louder as the track progressed so he could be heard. And this created one of the most impassioned, raw vocal performances in his entire musical career. Absolutely genius. Unfortunately, I have to unceremoniously wrap up the video here because it's so long already. What I'll do is I'll be uploading part two of The Guide on Wednesday, where I will start with 1979's Lodger, the final album in the Berlin trilogy, and we'll, we'll journey through all the way up to 2016's Black Star. So I hope you've enjoyed today's guide. Please comment down below if you, if you want to discuss your favorite Bowie albums or just, just get involved as we always do, and I'll see you soon.